Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We know this story. With the possible exception of the parable of the Good Samaritan, this is perhaps the most famous story in all of our canon. The prodigal son. We know the story. The story of the young son who asks for his inheritance early, heads out into the world, squanders it on dissolute living, only to find himself utterly lost and alone. Maybe some of us have been there. He finds that he is lost, and so he turns to head back home, only to be greeted by his father with open arms who wraps him up and throws a party in his name, killing the fatted calf like you do. His older brother, who had been there the whole time, the brother who had been doing everything right, sees the party and grows jealous and asks his dad, what gives? To which his father responds, son, all that I have is already yours. But we had to celebrate because your brother was dead and is now alive, was lost, but now is found. We know this story. And not just from our Bibles. We know this story, don't we? Chances are high we've all played some character in this story at one point in our life, whether we wanted to or not, and not always with the same ending. Who among us hasn't had some experience with a prodigal son or daughter or parent or cousin or friend or co-worker or parishioner. We know this story. And the challenge, as we know, is that it doesn't always end with someone coming home. And not all homecomings are celebratory. Truth is, there are those who take their inheritance, they go out there into the world, and they squander it. Prodigal, of course, means wasteful. It means excessively wasteful. Someone who squanders that precious gift of life in those more fleeting things of life, money, sex, power, that next high. I, for one, have done too many funerals in the wake of the opioid epidemic to not know this story. But the good news is that whether we make it home or not, grace is still ours. See, the beauty and the scandal of grace is that we don't do anything to earn it, and we, thank God, can't do anything to take it away. We hear this parable, and we think grace shows up in that moment when the father finally embraces the child, but the truth is it was there the whole time. It was there when the father gave over his inheritance. It was there when the son was utterly alone. It was there when he found his way back home. That's good news for those of us who might not find our way back home, for whom there will never be a party, for whom no one else will ever be jealous, because we remain lost. 
Wherever you find yourself on the journey of life today, friends, whether you're home, safe and sound, or whether you are wandering, the good news is that grace is still yours. It is yours today, and it will be tomorrow, just as it was yesterday. The grace of God is yours, but the challenge of grace is that in order to live, we have to fully embrace it. That is the tricky part, isn't it? We have to find our way to grab onto that grace, to embrace it, and allow ourselves to fully live. And sometimes, as in the prodigal son, we can do that on our own. But more often than not, it takes someone willing to help. Fortunately, we have good examples out there. We remember one today as our next hidden figure that year-long series in which once a month we highlight someone who changed the world, but whose story we may not know. Maybe her story will become our story. She was one who was a prodigal of her own right, who spent some time wandering, only once she was found she never forgot about those others who remained lost, and so she dedicated the rest of her life to reaching out to help them. In other words, friends, she, when recognizing that some didn't make it home, brought home to them. One of her biographers remembers the first time he met her. He went into one of the soup kitchens that she had started, one of the many throughout the course of her life, and he sat and waited while she was having a rather animated conversation with a woman who was clearly and utterly drunk. The woman was belligerent and was going on and on, just saying one non sequitur kind of thing after the other. It made no sense, and the woman, for whom he was waiting to speak, just sat and nodded her head, asking a nice question every now and then, until she finally noticed the gentleman waiting for her. When, he, when she noticed him, she excused herself to the woman who was speaking and turned to the gentleman and simply asked, did you need to speak with one of us? Did you need to speak with one of us? It's such a simple phrase, but in it is the gift of grace. A moment which lifted this woman beyond a mere object of need to a person of sacred worth. But that, of course, was who Dorothy Day was. She was born in Brooklyn on November 8, 1897. Her father was a sports writer, which meant that they moved around the country quite a bit, chasing after that next line of work, that next story. They moved in her young life from New York to San Francisco to Chicago and then back to New York. She was in San Francisco, Dorothy Day, in 1906 when that San Francisco earthquake hit. She was only eight years old, but she remembered it for the rest of her life. She said as tragic and as awful as that moment was, it was in that moment that she discovered something for the first time, something that she would carry with her. You see, as refugees streamed across the bay to where she was living in Oakland, she saw her mother and her neighbors jump into action. They pitched tents in their yards. They gave clothes off their back. They even set up a makeshift soup kitchen so that they could care for the people who were there. And what she noticed even beyond the mercy was that in that mercy, the people came alive. Her neighbors, for the first time, were living right before her eyes, and she would never let it go. She said it was the first time she recognized what it meant to love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, she didn't have that framework at eight years old. Her family wasn't exactly religious. They went to church every once in a while, mostly begrudgingly. Some of us know the feeling. But there was always something there, something that would nudge her. When she was a teenager, she found her way into an Episcopal church and was baptized, but it still didn't find that final draw for her. No, her attention instead was turned towards writing, which 
she discovered a gift for very early in life. She would stay up all day or in the night scribbling on a pink sheet of paper so that when they went to bed that night, she could tell her story, a new story, to her older sister. So she could share with her what it was that she was learning, some imaginative idea, some story that she could share. And her sister loved it. Her father even early recognized the gift that his young daughter had, and he helped her get some articles published in one of the Chicago Daily Tribunes. She put it on the children's page, and it was much celebrated even at her young life, at in, in her young age. Her father was much less supportive when she entered a contest for Greek and Latin and through the University of Illinois at age 16 and won $300. That was a full scholarship for all four years of school. Things have changed. <laughs> See, her father, just like her brothers, had never graduated from high school. And he believed that college was no place for a young woman, nor especially for an aspiring writer. Dorothy went anyway. She went off to college and, as would haunt her throughout the rest of her life, struggled with money, prodigal to the core. She really raced through that $300, remember, supposed to last all four years. Within just a year or so, she had squandered all of that money. She had taken a job that she hated working as a cook for a family for 20 cents an hour and quickly whipped through that as well, until by the end, penniless and nearly starving to death, she was forced to leave school in under two years and to find her way back home. Swallowing her pride, she moved to New York City with her family right before World War I. New York City at the time was alive with new ideas. She was mesmerized by all that she heard, all of the radicals around her. She had always had some kind of fondness for socialism because she had read Upton Sinclair and she thought there was something in it worth sharing. She got a job at a paper where she was the daily call that went out to workers, that went out to union people, that went out to anarchists and young radicals, and she began to write stories. She spent her evenings with her new friends tussing, talking about radical ideas. She would drink to excess, smoke like a chimney, and plot how they were going to change the world. But even then, she recognized that to change the world would take more than just talk. She would walk back late at night to her one little room she rented from an Orthodox Jewish woman. She would frequently pass people huddled over little fires, freezing nearly to death. And frequently she would take them with her to her little one bedroom. She couldn't stomach the idea of people being cold while she sat in warmth. Her friends used to dismiss her actions as her religious sentimentality, as that religious instinct. And it was there. Even through her hardest moments, it was there. It would draw her back. She kept finding that draw to a church. She almost never walked by a church without stopping in and sitting in the sanctuary for a moment to just pray. She felt it there, even through the next decade of her life, decidedly the most prodigal decade of her life, that she always had that tie to the church. Even when she began to drink way too much, even when she smoked way too much, even when she jumped in and out of relationship, when she found herself married, divorced, aborting a child, attempting suicide, even at her very darkest moment, she felt that tug of God's grace. and struggled to hold on. She heard the passion of her friends, but recognized the lack of hope in it. 
She knew that there had to be something else, and so she searched for something else. She still did what her friends did. She went on. She was even arrested and beaten almost to the point where she broke her back at a women's march. She then found her way down into other places to try and stand up for what is right, to help those who were poor and impoverished, to figure out how she might make a difference. In other words, she wasn't timid. The story goes that she was once in a New York City taxi, and the taxi driver pulled into a cemetery to attempt to take advantage of a young Dorothy Day, who managed to fight him off by biting him until he bled, and then insisted that he drive her to her original location while she lectured him about how to treat women. She found her way. She published her first novel, semi-autobiographical. It was scandalous at the day, the 11th Virgin, and used the royalty check to buy a little shack on Staten Island where she could be by the sea. She fell in love with a man, Forster, who loved her back, but who could never fully commit to her. They had a daughter, Tamar, and then the Depression arose. And in the wake of the depression, the need of the world came alive. Every place she walked, every place she went, she saw the tents, she saw the fire, she saw the people in need, and she longed for something to do to help. One day, almost on a whim, she went into a church and she had her daughter Tamar baptized. And there was a tether that she now had that she couldn't let go of, and pretty soon she was baptized herself. Her husband, who didn't believe in God, or in her common law husband, who didn't believe in God or marriage, meant that they were, had to be separated, and so they went out on their own. Her newfound Catholic faith was calling to her, but she didn't recognize the social gospel that she read in the gospel, in the practice of the faith itself. She read G.K. Chesterton, and she understood what he meant when he said that Christianity hadn't failed, it had never really been tried, and she was committed to trying it. She wrote for this Catholic paper that would go out to all the elites of the church and all of the trappings of religion. She couldn't understand how people could sit in an opulent space while there were poor and impoverished people out there. We know the feeling. And so as she went to a hunger march in December of 1932, she found her way to the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception and sat for a moment to pray. She prayed that God might show her how to use her gifts to care for the poor of this world. Two weeks later, she met Peter Morin, an exceedingly brilliant man who had left the monastic orders to live in solidarity with the poor, who had radical ideas that Dorothy had never heard before. She said at that time in Union Square, those with a blueprint to change the social order were a dime a dozen, but here was a man who was different. Here was someone who was radical and Catholic. Here was a Christian communist who was not interested in a red revolution, but a green one, getting everyone to live off the land and share what it was that they had. And they found an instant connection, a bond that would last for the rest of his life and that she would remember for the rest of hers. On May 1st, 1933, they published the first issue of The Catholic Worker a newspaper that was written in her kitchen. They printed 2,500 copies for that first run. At one cent apiece, they sold them. Still the cost of that paper today. It was a paper not directed to the elites, but to the poor. It was for the poor, to the poor. It was written for them trying to un burden and unleash the social gospel which was almost forgotten by the church of the day. It was for the dispossessed, the disinherited, the prodigal. And it was eaten up right away. 
Their intention originally was just to publish this paper, to just send out a paper to put these ideas out into the world, but almost immediately people began to show up at Dorothy Day's door looking for the woman who had these radical ideas and asking for a little help. How could she turn them away? She began to help in any way they could. When they were hungry, she fed them. When they needed a place to stay, she found a place for them to stay. She created farms where people could live together. It had a place for the mentally ill, no matter how ill someone was. It had a place for the addicted. It had a place for the least and the last and the lost. There were lots and lots and lots of challenges. It was never easy, but it was sometimes fun. She changed the world. By 1936, the paper was printing 150,000 copies a run. And houses of hospitality and farms for communal living were being replicated around the nation and around the world. The outreach ministry we do here at Asbury First owes much to the vision of Miss Dorothy Day. Not that she was perfect, but the good news is that she didn't have to be. And here's the even better news. Neither do we. Friends, the grace of God is ours. The choice is, how are we going to use it? Will we use the grace of God? We don't have to live in voluntary poverty like Dorothy Day did, but that doesn't mean we can't do something. How is God tugging at you? What is it that you're feeling in this world? How might you use the gifts that God has given you to make a difference, a lasting difference? Each and every one of us has a choice about how we're going to use our lives. Will we squander it in dissolute living on those more fleeting things of life, money, sex, power, that next high? Or will we find something that allows us to fully and freely live? The choice is ours. This is our story. How it will end, we don't know. But whether we make that turn is up to us. The good news is that even if they don't throw us a party when we do, even if they don't kill the fatted calf, wherever we find ourselves at that moment, we will finally be home. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. T'was grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we open our hearts to you. Hear our prayers. We give to you all that we are thinking about, our fears, our hopes, our dreams, and we ask that you infuse us with your love. We lift to you all of those who are suffering in body, mind, and soul. We pray for those who yearn to feel you with them. We pray for all who are afraid of their future. We ask a great measure of your peace to comfort our hearts each of us, all of us, in all that we do. 
for who you are to us, for your love and grace and peace and joy. We thank you. Lift us to your holy, sacred space where we know only love and feel only peace. Amen. If you are visiting with us this morning, welcome to Asbury First, where our mission is to love God and neighbor, to live fully, to serve all, and to repeat. It is so good to see all of you in worship with us this morning, and I invite each of those who are present to take and sign the Red Ritual of Friendship pad, which you will find toward the center of your aisle. As you get to know the names of those seated on your row, this is a way for us to get to know who you are as well. Friends, there is so much happening within the life of this church and within the life of this community. I invite you to take a look at your bulletin, take it home, and get to know about all of the activities and events that are happening here at Asbury First. Please be reminded that today, immediately following the 11 o'clock service, we will begin tours of Building 1010, which is the red brick building, to the right of this building. This is just the time for you to come and to learn more about the designs and the plans that we have for the new outreach center. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask any of the pastors who will be standing at each of the main exits immediately after service. Friends, as we consider all that is happening in this church and in our own lives, here is a moment when we give back to God as the ushers now wait on us for our morning tithes and offering. Mm -hmm.
We offer these gifts to you, asking for your blessing upon them, that they may bring comfort and heal to your children around the globe. We offer our lives to you, asking for your blessing upon us, that we might be faithful to you and to one another. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. of Jesus Christ to do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, in all the times you can, to all the people you can, so long as ever you can. Go in the name of Jesus Christ and do more good. Amen.